Hello, and thank you for listening to the NCFMB podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And in studio today, we have the mushroom maven, Mrs. <laughs> Amy M. You're listening Fox. to the NCFMB the podcast, <laughs> part of the A OG Fox Podcast Fox Network. The NCFNB podcast takes you behind the scenes of North Carolina's food and beverage industry. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at NCFB Pod. It's not quite the Scott Howell story, but it's not that. This episode sponsored in part by Food Scene. That's food S E E N dot com. Providing professional photography, social media management, video production, and website design. And now, enjoy the show. To be fair, on the 10th run. On the 10th run. And that was only because common sense dictated in my mind, Amy, don't do it again. My husband was like, come on, I just want to get a picture. Mm -hmm. I listened to my husband, see where that got me. You were peer pressured by your husband and your teenage son. Because he thought you were cool (laughs) for skateboarding. Yeah, Yeah. that that word cool and mom were used together, and I was in like (laughs) Flynn. Like, I wasn't thinking clearly. And now I I have to permanently live with my complete open dislocation of my right ankle. Oh, what fun. (laughs) As you said, the doctor said you had hamburger down Pretty there. Much. That sounds yeah. like the worst des- description yeah. of your but situation. It, but it was a cool party trick. You, know, you could lift your leg up, and I could like flex it, and my ankle would hold on there. When I let go, the bone would pop right back out. Yeah, I grossed everybody out on the street that day. And you know what? <laughs> Just to relate it back to why we're here, yes. I bet you there's probably a mushroom that kind of looks like your ankle did after that. Thank God, like no. a chicken of the woods or hen Thanks. of the woods mushroom. I would not no, eat that. I, I'd be scarred for life. <laughs> well, I bet if you could find a new mushroom and you're foraging, you could name it like a hamburger mushroom or ankle mu- ankle hamburger mushroom. Yeah, a- a- yeah, like a well, maybe like Amy ankle mushroom. There you go. Or like, like you know, COD complete open dislocation <laughs> the cod mushroom. The yeah, cod that's mushroom. That's not even better. It's like fish. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> there so, are some funny names for mushrooms. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm glad you yes. even brought that up because all right. So today we're talking about mushrooms and foraging and wild mushrooms, all those things. But it's so hilarious that you're looking at the names of mm-hmm. mushrooms in general. And I mean, I wrote down a couple just at the top: beef steak polyphore, uh, the oh, fragrant uh, chanterelle, the indigo lactarius, uh, and then I love this one: the mushroom formerly known as Cantharellus sibarius. What is this like? Is are mushrooms now like uh, famous musicians or so? <laughs> but I mean, there's yeah, lion's mane mushroom, hedgehog mushroom. Oh yeah, hand of the woods. But but uh, so you, Amy, yes, you cultivate mushrooms. I do, I do, and it's very misleading because the business name and I, you know, spend a lot of time driving down the road by myself delivering, so I think a lot. And recently I've been thinking, dang, got it. Why did I put forage in my business name? Because I don't have time to forage anymore. I have not Mm. had time to forage for a year. So it's kind of, you know, misleading. Okay. (laughs) Well, there goes half the subjects that we were going to discuss. I guess this is going to be a short podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, trust me. We can find things to talk about. I bet. (laughs) But no, you can still ask questions about foraging. I can still answer them. Sure. I I won't ever claim to be a leading expert there are plenty of people that are way more knowledgeable than me and whenever chefs are looking for forage product i have a person that i always recommend well just can we jump in right there and give us like the general idea of how do you know which are poisonous and which are which you can eat like well, is there a general well, if you eat them and you don't die no i'm just kidding. <laughs> there you go <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding um actually foraging is how i got into this whole shebang anyway mm-hmm. so with that, definitely you don't ever, ever, ever want to eat a mushroom without making sure you know what it is and you've positively identified it, not tried to fit it to the ID. You know, whether that's you've taken a class, you've worked with an expert, or you're an intelligent person who's capable of doing your own research, which I like to think I'm smart like that. Mm. So, <laughs> so that's what happened is I got into it because I found out that there were mushrooms in the woods and you could eat them and not die if you don't eat those. And so I just went online and literally typed in the Google search string, um, edible mushrooms, um, non-poisonous lookalikes. That was another search string and just started doing research. And I started out with the mushrooms that are easy to identify, which would be your oyster mushroom. And there are certain characteristics that, you know, will lead you to know that for sure that's what you have, such as the gills, um, continuing into the stem and spore prints and what have you. But also, I think just as much as it's important to start out with an easy mushroom to identify, it's very important to um, 
do your research and be able to identify the ones that are poisonous that are prevalent in the area. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah, so like as a frame of reference um, for those that listen to the show, when we were in Lambstock, we interviewed Clark Barlow, who oh yes, definitely. he is. Uh, he if you're the mushroom lady, then he's the mushroom man. Um, yeah, and, and his, his I believe his wife is as well. I haven't met them, but I've girlfriend, heard a lot, I think. Or girlfriend, okay. I've yeah, heard I think he said of, partner. Partner. Don't put a ring you know on her finger yet. That's right. I guess in this day and age, partner is the appropriate word. Don't yeah. make assumptions. Yeah, Matt and I are partners, but we also are not married to each other. Exactly. There's partners in different <laughs> <Yeah>. ways. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I noticed you zipped it up a little bit. I can, I'm not seeing as much chest hair as I saw earlier today. What's going on there? I'm, it's, it's Friday. Casual Friday, baby. <laughs> Let it actually, fly. Actually, it's because he saw you looking at it. So he zipped yeah. it up. That's yeah. what it is. It felt sexually harassed. Exactly. Yeah, you got <laughs> to be, be careful in this day and age. But you know, I realized I, I had... No, Clark Barlow is someone totally different. I know who he is. I was thinking of the Besets. Sorry. They are very knowledgeable about forging. But he is definitely, yeah. too. So we we spoke with Clark and he was talking about um, when we were at, when we were in Lambstock. I mean, one of the first things he did is as soon as he got into the uh, to the open field, he just immediately ran into the forest because he wanted to start foraging. <laughs> I used to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think it's like you know that's how you th- there are different types of people, and one type mm-hmm. is one that is obsessed with finding food in the forest, yes. and that's something he's definitely into. And he's a fantastic chef at Heirloom. Yes, that's exactly. his restaurant in Charlotte. Yep. yep. Um, but he had spoken a lot about, you know, there's a huge, uh, progression that's happened in North Carolina Mm -hmm. because, uh, wild mushrooms were not available. Technically it was illegal to have wild, wild mushrooms in a restaurant. Uh, like chefs weren't allowed to buy them, uh, up until just recently. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting. It's been, I, uh, had been communicating with the person who was with the health department, uh, that was a, the head, I guess, if you will, mm-hmm. of the project. So I'd been following along with him and communicating, just making sure I wasn't doing anything on my end that I shouldn't be doing. And it's been interesting because my understanding of it is I looked at the code, yeah, the food law, food code, whatever you want to call it. And it was weird because it was kind of like, we have all these rules. And we just kind of went, ooh, we jumped off the cliff and decided, oh, wait, now we need to just write the next subject. And no one ever really completed it. So I believe the way it was worded is that it had to be – um, collected and identified, sold by, you know, someone who was qualified, some sort of certification or whatever. But it never clarified what that was. Right. So then I think, what was that, two years ago where I think the first thing that popped up was, I don't know whose restaurant it was. Was it his maybe? It was I, it one might out have of been, Charlotte. It, it was, it was of, probably yeah. Clark at Heirloom because he yeah. had a lot to do with the uh, the, the, the change in the yes. law. And or it, at least the evalu- or the definition of the law. Exactly. And I remember seeing that first article pop up, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So that's what got me paying attention to it. And then mm-hmm. I ended up, I don't like to say people's names publicly in case they don't want me to say it, but the person at the, um, what is it, National Institutes of Health and Public Safety or something like that, which is, I just say, health department. Sure. Um, this gentleman was very, very nice and uh, very helpful. And <clears throat> excuse me. See, there's that whole thing I knew I was going to do. I was going to have to clear my throat at some point. But you're allowed. You're I'm human. Allowed. Only five times on the show, though. So um, you got four oh, more. I got four more. Yeah. Okay. I got I to pace myself here. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it was interesting because that's exactly what he had said had happened. Is that you know now that they had to work out and it was a process you know working through they were talking with a person out of south carolina who is very well known in the industry for um he has classes that he teaches and yeah that's uh trad cotter trad since, since you were gonna say it and I'm, I'm sure trad wouldn't mind me saying that i'm sure he'd love for me to say his name you know right <laughs> let's hear more about yeah. trad He's well yeah awesome. i think if anybody in, in any of the carolinas is interested in yes. mushrooms they're going to know trad cotter's name exactly right. and and he's our first and foremost you know expert in in the field if you will and he does teach many classes but one of the ones is certification class and i know that you know, they had been speaking with him. They had also been talking about trying to offer it through, um, I think it was the NC Ag Department. Then that got into the the legal aspect and North You're Carolina. talking about a certification to yes. be a mushroom expert yes. or what is it called, a mycologist? It All it is is just the, the whole point of this course. My, mycologist is, is a very broad term that can be used in different ways. But right. For the purpose of this, it's just you're certified that there's you're stating through the certification that you are able to identify the mushrooms that are safe to eat. Whereas like a chef may or may not know and you walk in there and you say, hey, check out my haul of whatever it could be something, Amanita, 
or whatever, and it turns out it's the poisonous amine, that's just not going to know unless he's knowledgeable about it. So that's the whole point of it, is to make sure that you are someone that can identify the species as they are and not mistake them for something else that could poison someone or possibly kill them. So that, that was the whole premise, and there's been a whole bunch of conflict behind this thing because then you have the people who forage, and they like to sell the mushrooms, but they don't want to... Some people are anti-government, you know, you hear about that, and they're like, oh, more regulation, that angers me, and I know what I'm doing, and then you have the people who don't want to pay the money because the certification class is not inexpensive, and that was one of the things that they, the state was looking at, was making it so that it was through the state and not through a private entity, but then that's where the attorney general had said something along the lines of, oh, I don't want that liability with the state, so then it went back through the private sector. Now, to clarify, although Trad Cotter's course is most excellent and I highly recommend it, I don't want people to misunderstand and think that you only can get certified through him. That is not the case. Right. He's um, just one of many yes, that can yes. get you certified, approved. Yes. So you, are you a certified I mushroom person? I didn't bother doing it, and I'll tell you why. Because even though in the beginning, this this just, I never planned on having this business, and I can get into that if y'all want. Sure. But, yeah, because you're a registered nurse. Yes, and there's a story behind that. Yeah. But for me, it was just a hobby. Foraging is cool. I can go out in the woods and get delicious things, you know. So for me, it was just foraging. And then when I got into the business, which we'll get into, when I started to try to sell Forge product, this was before this whole debacle started about being certified. Well, you know, I'd go and try to offer some stuff to the chefs I work with, and they'd be like, well, I'd love to buy from you, but so-and-so, and again, I'm not going to name anybody, especially because this person likes their privacy. So-and-so was just in here, and I was like, this so-and-so sure keeps showing up a lot before me. <laughs> I know who that so-and-so you know who is that you're talking is. about. Yeah, and, and you know there's... They're a very private person. Right, but very fascinating person as well. Cool person. I mean, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so knowledgeable. I could just sit down with this person and just pick their brain. And then the, the things that they do with the wild foods, it just blows your mind. And right. so any chef in the area that I would say most of them would know who that person is. But because of that, I feel like, well, that person has that area cornered. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense for me to even pursue that. So that's why I joke around because I honestly, even if I wanted to, I don't have time because growing, I work seven days a week. You know, I don't have time to do it. And I'm not going to say that I don't hit some of my little spots that I know about and I'll grab it. And right now, um, they haven't made it so through at the farmer's market. They haven't placed that regulation yet that you have to be certified, although it's coming. Mm -hmm. but, so you can sell forage products at the yes, farmer's right market. right now. Yeah. So... On that note, though, the only reason why I would get certified is that if I did come across something and I wanted to offer, because a lot of my farmer's market customers do ask for it to be legally compliant, which I always want to be, um, I would do it for that reason. And there is someone locally who is very knowledgeable, who is working on putting a course together that my understanding would be affordable for those who would like to do it hmm. yeah but the the discussion for you like you said is almost null and void because you're actually growing the yes. mushroom so yes. you know that they're not poisonous you're cultivating yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> i definitely have not <laughs> killed anyone yet that's right. really bad for business yeah, Let's talk on this right <laughs> yeah seriously well at least i haven't killed them with a the mushroom right we'll leave right, it at right. that so <laughs> We partnered up with Triangle Wine Company because these guys are awesome. They offer weekly wine tasting events, a wide range of wine and beers from around the world, and an easy online store to find the wines that you'd like. They also offer pickup, local delivery, and shipping. We even set up a promo code NCFB so you can receive 10% off all future purchases. Go to trianglewineco.com or one of their three locations, and for 99 bucks, pick up the NCFNB six-pack, which includes three white wines, three red wines, and we threw an official NCFNB hat in the bag. So once again, buy your wine online or in-store at the Triangle Wine Company and use our promo code NCFB during checkout to receive 10% off your future wine and beer purchases. Go to trianglewineco.com or click the top of our website at ncfbpodcast.com. You have a great little five-minute video uh, that we'll have oh to put gosh. a link on. What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what video? It's not that video. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Uh, <laughs> All that, that could really get some hits. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure glad that uh, she has finally come out of her shell. Matt. Yeah, seriously, she's on. so shy wait, to begin wait, with. Wait. I've come out of my shell. Oh boy, y'all don't even know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is me normally, so, but y'all know that. Yeah, <laughs> and non-caffeinated. Not yet. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but you do have a video that's about uh, five minutes long or so, but it it is insane because you get to see your facility. I was kidding with Matt. I said it looks like. Oh my gosh, that is like. From a year ago, isn't it? Yeah, it's your God. <laughs> a year wasn't that long ago, just so you know. Boy, you made it, it sound like it was like a decade. <laughs> Three hundred and sixty five <laughs> days. But in my business I think, last the I changes checked. that have occurred, oh, that's a long time ago. Really? Well yeah. I, your facility as it was yeah. in that video and we'll speak it we'll, we'll put links on the show yeah, notes yeah. so you can access it. But Amy is uh got the the, the mask on and she goes into her <laughs> little grow room, which kind of looks like a cross between Dexter's kill room yeah. and Breaking Bad's Heisenberg. <laughs> meth lab because you've got like the plastic everywhere and these big five gallon uh drum barrels that you're 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 growing yeah. uh fungus everywhere and uh it and then you know of course there's like um co2 levels that have to yes. be monitored and uh yes. humidity of course and and it's a pressurized room i mean it was it's extremely perfect. fascinating just to watch <laughs> so i encourage everyone to, to to take the moment and see what it looked like a year ago a year ago yeah but tell <laughs> tell us a little bit about how i mean how did you even design i know you said your husband had something to help out with in the in the structure of that design yes. and, and go from yes. there so please inform us sure well you know you you said something that's really funny that you mentioned breaking bad because in my lab i have a laminar flow hood and I, honestly i can't remember that video i don't even know what's in it was did i go into my lab in there I don't know. Did it look like me standing in front of this big thing that had a had a hood on top of a table? Is that in the video? I don't even remember. I think you're just in the room where all the mushrooms were being grown. Oh, yeah, because I didn't. Yep, I didn't have that laminar flow hood. But it's funny. I have a laminar flow hood in my in my lab, which we can get into the nerdy parts if y'all need to know. But it's funny because it's a brand called Air Science. And I don't know. I just do stuff like this all the time but i literally took masking tape and put a piece above the word air science and a piece below and i put it's bitch it's air science bitch <laughs> <laughs> because you know i love that science bitch yeah you know? oh, that's right oh yeah <laughs> that was from breaking jesse Bad. says that yes. yeah so when you said that i was like oh my gosh that's hilarious little tie in there yeah <laughs> nice and then the other thing you said when you talk about you know, killing people because, you know, that's what Dexter did. I was like, oh, I'll never look at my grow room the same. But it is kind of funny because I joke around, you know, when people come to my farm and I've been explaining it back in my incubation room, which is where you, after you've inoculated the blocks with the spawn, and if y'all start crossing it, I was like, what the hell is she saying? We, I can explain these things. But, you know, mushroom blocks put off a lot of CO2. They're just like us breathing oxygen, exhale CO2. Well, if I didn't have telemetry in there, you know, like I think it's what the average space is like 300 parts per million of CO2. That's what we live with comfortably. Oh, well, what does CO2 do? It will suffocate you if it gets too high and then eventually kill you. Yeah. So I have telemetry in, you know, my fruiting chamber as well, my incubation room. The incubation room is going to be cranking that CO2 so that when it gets to a certain level, then my exhaust fan kicks in. So I always joke around people. I tell them, I was like, you don't ever want to piss me off because I can lock you in this room and now I got pigs down there to dispose of your body. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> there's a whole new television show. Showtime's about to. Do I mean, for those of you that listen to Criminal and that stuff and those podcasts, I think we just got crossovers. <laughs> See, I, that's Coming like, this fall, Fox. I'm, I'm full of bad jokes, and that's one of my jokes is when I talk and I'm trying, you know, because after a while you start getting into the, you know, specifics. People's eyes might cross and glaze over. depends on who you're talking to, you know, and so that's why I have to throw out those awful jokes every once in a while. Well, so I didn't, I didn't realize that until you said it now, but I, we've all, you know, taking science classes when you're in elementary yeah. school, you know that plants give off oxygen and that mm-hmm. humans give off carbon dioxide and that we kind of work together Mm -hmm. to help each other out but i didn't realize so mushrooms they're just like us they're human Mm -hmm. in that sense so yeah but obviously then uh mushrooms help out in a in a in a forest where there aren't humans running around or animals running around like they help perpetuate that 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 era i would imagine like that's i've never thought about that do they i mean are they 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 must be symbiotic to the 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 like to trees and to plant life 
to well, keep the to keep the air a certain way, or are funguses just fungus, pain in the ass and you got to get rid of them? I don't know. Lord, no. As a matter of fact, you can thank some of those delicious mushrooms, such as chanterelles and morels. Um, they, you know, everyone loves to eat. They mm-hmm. have what's called a mycorrhizal relationship with certain trees, and just to say that in layman's terms, basically. I mean, yes, there are people who were, I think, China's cultivating morels, but it's like, again, I don't get into the foraging much anymore. I'm very, like, horse with blinders. I'm growing, you know, so. Yeah. But they're growing some species of, um, which was before thought you just absolutely could not grow morels, but they're doing that. People have said they're not as flavorful. I wouldn't know, hadn't had them. But the point is, is that, like, people are always asking me, can you grow chanterelles? I'm like, dude, if I grow chanterelles, I'd have some money in my pocket. Mm, you know, because yeah. you can't because they're mycorrhizal. That's not to say that some someday someone won't figure that out, but if there's that not that host tree, you know, mushroom relationship, they, you know, it just doesn't happen. Microvisal. Mycorrhizal. Mycorrhizal. Yes. Okay, so for the layman. Like what rhizome, do- myco, my- yeah. mycorrhizal. It's kind of like you got the rhizomes of the plant. I'm probably going to screw this up because I haven't looked at it in a while, but myco, mycology, mycelium, mm-hmm. you know, mycelium, mycorrhizal. It's like a relationship between the mycelium of the mushroom and then. So yeah. they can only grow on trees, basically, for our purposes. Um, It's the fact that it's either, it's more like they're growing from the ground like for instance morels are growing from the ground around the trees and you know like i said i'm, I'm not going to claim to have deep knowledge into it because like i said my shift went more to growing mm-hmm. so like if you were to speak to that person that you and i both know that i'm sure they could explain it way better than i ever could if they listen to this be like oh my gosh what the hell are you talking about you totally screwed that up like, yeah i did boy <laughs> The flavor, flavor. Well, yeah, exactly. A fungus. Next time she's gonna have to wear instead of a big clock, like a huge Shrew. mushroom. Yeah, oh, around we just it. showed our age because I said about the clock. My kids looked at me like, huh? Yeah. You what? Know? What? Yeah, because my husband was like, flavor, flavor. You, you know, know that's gonna come back someday, like when we're watching television back. with our kids. Like somebody's gonna come just out like wearing Bell a big bottom. clock or yeah. something. Yeah, they came back. Yeah. I got a, a, one just sidebar uh, <laughs> anecdotal thing that was hilarious. Is uh, I, uh, you, you were, you dined with your family at Standard Foods a while ago, back when I was working there. And I was, I went to your table and you're having a great meal. We were crushing you with food and bringing you a bunch of things. Mm. And, uh, you're there with your husband and your two teenage children. And they are a hoot like you two. Uh, (laughs) We have a good time. It's a fun family. And I look at both of them and I said, So are you two like super into mushrooms too? And I (laughs) think your daughter just looked at me and went, Ugh. Like she didn't even want to answer, and your and your son was like, yes. "I am so over mushrooms. Like I don't even want to. <laughs> don't even talk to me about mushrooms." Well, it's funny. I, I actually, I would venture to say he probably even went as far as to say, "Hell no, that's nasty." That's usually yeah. what I hear. <laughs> but he works for me. He'll work for me. We will not like with farmers markets. Farmers markets are a real challenge because you can only be in so many places at once, and so you have to have an employee and have an employee work a farmers market. It's difficult mm-hmm. for for many reasons. But you know, one time I talked to my son about it, and he goes, "Yeah, you don't want me to farmers market." I'll be sitting there looking pissed off. I'm there to begin with, and then when they come up, like, "Well, which mushroom tastes good?" He said, "I look at them." Like, he, he said, "I look at them. They all taste like ass." <laughs> it's like. Yeah, I don't want you ever working a farmer's nope. market for well, me. Thank you. <laughs> at least he's got that self awareness that he knows. Like, listen, this wouldn't be good for us. Yes, but, yes. So, well, I'm interested. <laughs> g- give us and our listeners a insight into how one goes from becoming a nurse to a mushroom maven. It's it's a sad story, actually. Aww. Um, I will say this. Do I, I need Kleenex? I we, hope not. Yeah. I hope not. Lord, I, I don't. I definitely do want. Do not want to cry. I said, why did you put that in my mind? Well, you said it's a sad. You're the one that <laughs> said is, it's a sad it story. Is. It is. It is. But um, I will put this out there. I had always known that one day I would own my own business again. This is the second business I've owned. Um, I just. I'm an independent person. I'm motivated, so I knew that I wanted to, you know, work for myself instead of constantly putting my energy into something that really ultimately didn't benefit me. Mm-hmm. Um, so the sad story is uh, back when, let's see, huh, spring of 2015, I was working as a nurse, and my father was diagnosed with mesothelioma. So. Mm-hmm. 
my father's divorced and had no siblings and my brother lives in Arizona. So I was only the only person there to care for him. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunately, it quickly progresses and long story made incredibly short. I had to quit my job to care for him. Mm -hmm. And, um, at that time, I was just growing as a hobbyist because when I said I started out with foraging, that started because I um, visited my mother-in-law up at Lake Gaston in, I think it was July of 2014 or something like that, and she would buy bread from the chef that lived up there at this little tiny flea market, farmer's market thing they have. And that was where, you know, I saw he had these pans with these little shriveled up mushrooms. It turned out to be forage mushrooms. thought that was really cool, and he had told me, you know, that he had foraged them and and... He was a really nice guy, and a few times I had reached out to him, and he gave me some advice on, and then I just went from there and just started going, you know, like when you talked about Clark getting in, he gets into a field and goes, woods, oh, you know, and he runs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my family was just like, oh. <laughs> Mom's off in the woods again. Yeah, I mean, they, they <laughs> hated it. I mean, it was just drove them crazy, but I digress. But in any case, that's kind of how it happened. So then when the wintertime came, there just really wasn't much out there. And I was like, ooh, I bet I can grow these things. I learned how to grow a lot of trichoderma. Trichoderma is that lovely green mold that if you let stuff sit around, you see a lot of times it'll pop up. And I'm sure if you've ever Jeez. worked. It, yeah, if you ever go into any walk-in cooler, eventually you'll you'll see it's not harmful or anything. Um, sometimes it's on bread, but whatever. You know. Yeah. You hear that, Sarah? It's not harmful. <laughs> She well, always wants to immediately throw out the cheese if it's on any part of it. No, yeah. that's a whole different Slice that thing. Cut off. Well, yeah. cheese yeah. is mold to yeah, begin with. Yeah, I was going to say, that's exactly. a whole different animal there. Yeah, Didn't we create penicillin from that particular type mm -hmm. of mold? Now, that's not to say that there aren't molds out there that are dangerous, but, sure. but yeah, you are correct. But with, you know, just with trichoderma that I'm specifically talking <clears> about that you'll see on vegetables, to my knowledge from what I've read, that's not harmful. Of course, mm -hmm. I always like to put all those disclaimers in there in the Sioux heavy <laughs> climate we live in. Yeah. <laughs> But that's right. We already discussed with Shannon Healy that in a post-apocalyptic world, that <laughs> lawyers would be the first to go. Yeah. yeah. But speaking of that, from Shannon, you would definitely be part oh. of his apocalyptic team. <laughs> we, you are a yeah. top recruit, Te yeah. definitely yeah. like number one draft pick. <laughs> yeah, people people joke around because you know, I mean, there's a there's a topic that's a hot button topic right now, but. So, of course, I, I feel like, oh, gosh, if I even say this, and people are like, oh, can't believe she said that. But people have joked with me before because, you know, I was raised by a Marine. So I was raised with guns, respecting guns, and yeah. going to a range and shooting guns, not mm -hmm. going out and popping a cap in someone's ass, not that kind of stuff, you know, or being an idiot and waving it around. I mean, I was raised that it's responsibly a gun, yes. Responsible gun ownership. Exactly. Yeah. So, yes, my husband and I own guns. And like I said, I was hesitant to bring it up because, you know, people are – it's an emotional topic It's a hot right button now. at this it moment. Really, it really is. But, you know, what? I am who I am. I don't – pretend to be something I'm not. And yes, I am a gun owner and I do have a concealed carry permit. You know, I'm not one that goes around. I'm not packing guys, I promise. I mean, I was going to watch what I was saying next <laughs> from this point on. I'll pop cap in your ass. No. <laughs> and then have the pigs eat you. Exactly. Exactly. No, but you. Not to get too political, but I think if we stated there's difference and it's good yeah. that you're bringing the awareness because yeah. there's difference between people who are mentally stable and have a concealed carry permit and responsibly owning guns exactly. versus people who are willy nilly auto are not mentally stable and exactly. own automatic weapons. Exactly. So, and yeah. then there's Amy. Yeah, and that's a whole different breed of animal. Somewhere right there. in between. <laughs> I think mentally stable. No, definitely not. Definitely We're 31 not. minutes, I don't know. You just you, you find out for yourself. But I only bring that up because I needed to give a little backstory. And like I said, in this climate, I felt like I kind of needed to, to, to enter that topic very mm -hmm. delicately. But yes, we're responsible gun owners. And, you know, we, we are all about, you know, certain types of regulation that makes it more safe and that's a whole different animal we won't get into that but my point was is that because you know we don't walk around going hey guys we have guns it's not a topic that we bring up ever it's just a fact and so there are people who know us really well they know you know that we do have them and then people know that i grow mushrooms and can forage so the joke has been someone said said one time years ago well, if hell ever go, breaks loose or something like that, I know where I'm going. She can protect us and feed us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the next door neighbor had said something as to that effect, too. So several people have said that basically, what did he say? Armed to the teeth and 
and can find anything to eat or something. I don't until remember. Until the teeth can just, find anything to eat. Cool. It was funny. Um, all right. So that <laughs> we got sidetracked. But so, yes, we will. So you're, you were talking about your dad. You were yes. taking care of your dad. Yes. Yes. And you were a registered nurse at yeah. this point. Yeah. yeah. So, of course, you had the experience or the education to care for him in a, yeah. in a professional sense. Yeah. And so, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, backing up a second. I mean, my first degree is uh, in zoology from NC State back in 1994. Yeah, 94. Yeah. Woo-woo. So, yeah, definitely. So, I've got that. And then I decided to get an associate's degree in nursing because it didn't make any damn bit of sense to me to get another bachelor's degree. But... Ended up getting that and getting a BSN. I only bring that up because I gave up a career. And that was frustrating to work that hard and get two degrees in a field that I gave up. Funny thing, and this does tie into standard foods, because I was only growing as a hobbyist. I I never, never, ever had any intention of owning a business growing mushrooms. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew eventually I'd own a business, but it sure as hell wasn't this. How, um, can you just really quickly give us a 101 on how does one, as a hobbyist, grow mushrooms? Like, how, how do you do that? There are many different ways to do it. That that There's no real brief synopsis. What I'll say is this. If anyone's ever interested in growing mushrooms on a hobbyist level, yeah, there are tons and tons of resources online. As a matter of fact, I'll plug this group. There is a group on Facebook called Mushroom growing it is a wonderful resource there are a number of commercial growers that haunt that forum and will give reliable advice of course there's the people who think they know everything and give people bad advice but i'm not talking about the commercial ones but you know you, you kind of take things with a grain of salt but mm-hmm. um there is a i think it's a dvd series that actually i started with as one of the many things i used as a resource i think it was called let's grow mushrooms or something like that on my website i think i have I think I kept it there. should have been resources. I, I might have taken it down. I don't know. But I think it was called Let's Grow Mushrooms. And it's great because it talks about the different ways you can grow on straw, you can grow on cardboard. I mean, definitely things that aren't going to be good for a large volume commercial. But um, If you're just making them to eat yeah, at home. Yeah, there's yeah. many ways. Hey, you know what? They can come to a farmer's market, buy a grow kit from me. That's how they can do it. There you go. <laughs> Instant gratification, baby. Absolutely. <laughs> well, let's just be honest. Let's let Amy make it and then just buy hers. It's just because so much easier. Yeah. I have indulged in some <laughs> fox farms and forage mushrooms from time to time. Cool. And you've got some serious selection. Uh, but again, I didn't want to stray too far. You were, you were doing this. Um, Just on a hobby level, no intention. And then I was in this group, which is another great group on Facebook for someone who's looking to get into foraging mm-hmm. in North Carolina, um, called the North Carolina Mushroom Group. Um I left that group and all groups on Facebook associated. Nothing to do with the groups. It's just I found I was getting too distracted. So I just got out of all that stuff and just focus on what I'm doing. But it's a great group. And um, there was a guy who's a friend of mine, became a friend through that group. And he had reached out to me. And this was back in the winterish spring being of the year 2015 and was like hey i know you're growing mushrooms can i buy some i'm like <laughs> this is the point where i'm like going from <clears throat> i'd started out with the what is it the laundry basket method then moved on with straw and moved on to buckets and so i got to a point where as a hobbyist i was growing way more mushrooms than any we could eat and of course i've got the kid who thinks one who thought they taste like ass right. you know and so just only so much you can give away. So I think I even gave the guy mushrooms. Well, funny thing, his neighbor through the woods, Debbie Brown. Oh. Yes. Debbie, uh, she mm-hmm. is a, I don't even know what her title is, but uh, she. Farm, farm consultant. She's a farm consultant for Standard Foods and really just knows every farm uh, yes. and farmer and yeah. what they're doing in the entire state of North yeah. Carolina. You want a product, I don't care how obscure it is. You ask her. She'll mm. tell you. Yeah, Deb. She is a wealth of information. She is. And then some. She is. And so I do know that, or I shouldn't say I do know, but I, I, I understand that if anybody's ever looking, she you know, will do paid consulting and she's worth mm-hmm. every penny. But he told her. I don't, I don't even know how that came about. I just know that somehow she found out about the mushrooms. The next thing I know, she's in my basement at my house where my business started out. And I mean, looking back on that, I'm kind of like, I don't know how she was impressed, but you know, Deb, she's cool. She's walking around like, wow, this is cool. And she says, I want these for the grocery. And then at the time, Scott Crawford was the chef. And then evidently he saw them, wanted them for the restaurant. And I'm over here going, I just started messing around with trying to figure out how to grow mushrooms, I think, in 
I don't know, maybe December or January, and this is June. Of and, 20 yeah, it was 16? So started foraging July 2014. Started messing around with starting to try to figure out how to grow them maybe December of 2014, January 2015. This is June, June 2015. of 2015. So this is a very short wham, yeah. bam, thank you, ma'am kind of thing going on here. And she is like, well, I want them. And I'm like, I said, I I don't even own a business. And she's like, okay, so you're going to have to get, you know, your business license. You're going to do this. And I'm over here, my eyes wide open. And my husband's back there because I had lost my income as a nurse. Yeah. And I felt that foot on my butt pushing me forward. Do it. You'll figure And I'm a perfectionist. I'll just go ahead and admit it. I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> I just will. So I don't like to do something unless I feel like I know what I'm doing. I don't. I don't tend to like to learn on the fly, but guess what I've been doing for the past almost three years? Learning on the fly. So that's yeah. how this business started. It was just, it's not how I would ever advise anyone to go into this business. Because I actually taught a class um, back at the Organic Grow School in Asheville, not this past, was it? Hell, time flies. I came from it was I think it was 2017, spring, March, something like that. I don't know. But I taught it. It was on the business of mushrooms. And that was alongside Trad Cotter because he and I had talked one time and I had just said, you know, it's really frustrating because people come into this just like, oh, dude, I want to grow mushrooms. I can do what I want. Money's just going to fly in my bank account. I mean, people really talk like that and sound <laughs> like that. Yes, they, they have called me. But mushrooms are a serious currency, though. I, I mean, See, over, I mean, around the world, let's yeah. be honest, I mean, there are like chanterelles, morels, those yes. are expensive. And oh, then yeah. we haven't even got in, gotten into truffles mm -hmm. and where that can go. I mean, the, exactly. they have like Sotheby's auctions for yes. freaking yes. Uh, the huge white, winter white mushrooms exactly. or winter white truffles that are going for tens of thousands of dollars. But those are foraged mushrooms or, you know, some people are growing truffles. So that's a whole different level of this game. But when you get into, you know, the mushrooms such as the oysters and shiitake and whatever else is commercially cultivated, yes, you can have a business doing it. And I'm not going to say you couldn't ever get rich doing it. I'm sure those corporations up in Pennsylvania aren't crying. But when you're looking at it on a small business, there are people that really do believe that it's just easy money. And it's not. I'm here to tell you it's not. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And the other thing. She's that, really just saying that to everyone so she does no competition. Right. You know, I, I she did, sits every night on a, on a pile full of money. Remember, remember earlier, I think in the podcast, I said, I think I'm a smart girl. <laughs> 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 but no, I wish I was sitting on a pile of money. But it, it is. It's one of those things where there's the idea of having a business growing mushrooms, and then there's the reality. And I came into this very differently, so I feel like a, a very different but useful perspective. Because if you come into this all starry-eyed, you're probably not as likely to look at it more with business sense as you should. Mm -hmm. And then whereas me, <clears throat> I definitely don't advise the way I did. It came in not knowing what I should have. And trust me, I could have saved thousands of dollars and thousands and thousands of hours if I had just gone and worked with a consultant and spent the money, which, funny thing, because right now when you said mushroom currency, it is a hot button topic. You know, people, if you go online, there are plenty of places talking about grow mushrooms, make money. And you know why they're doing this. Let's get real here. Everybody likes to make money. So if you have a social media site, how are you going to get hits? You're not going to sit there and say, oh, you want to grow mushrooms, work seven days a week, be dog tired, blah, 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 and whatever the <laughs> negative aspects are, you're going to promote it as something that it's going to generate hits, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Clickbait. So, exactly. So, you know, like I've had, I actually, I'm not full of myself at all, so I don't want to come off that way, but I have turned down quite a few interviews because I have had, especially after I taught that class at, at the Organic Grower School, I had a number of these entities call me, want to interview me, and as soon as I told them, if you're trying to make a piece that's a get-rich-quick and you're not going to post the reality, I'm not interested, and all of a sudden, yeah. there's crickets. Thanks for your time! Uh -huh. And that's what they were doing. Um, I I did agree to a podcast that, that was talking about it, and that was great, and then I agreed to an interview with Hobby Farms, and and that was they were talking about the business of mushrooms, but they had the reality in there. So those are the types of things I agree to because mm -hmm. I don't 
talk poorly about the business. I don't build it up. I just say what it is, just plain speak. Well, can you let us in on what makes the difference between you, like, why would a renowned chef choose your mushrooms over another mushroom farmer slash girl? But what? Right, obviously, I'm kidding. But I'm what, kidding. No, no, no. That's uh, that's a given. You wouldn't be on our show for it. Uh, I was totally joking, guys. I'm so not like that. No, but uh, in, on a serious note, like, what are some of the technical differences that make a quality product or a quality mushroom versus not? You know, what are some of the te- I techniques? I can totally answer that. Remember when I said I was a perfectionist? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my husband actually makes fun of me because, and and the people that work for me, I'm sure there's a lot of this. For those of y'all can't hear it major eye roll just occurred <laughs> yeah. because you know i bust their bottoms um <laughs> i'm trying not to i'm trying to be a little bit you know not so potty mouth like i normally am be but, who you are yeah I let bust, your freak flag fly then I, it's high and proud <laughs> flapping in the wind i bust their balls all the time you know i'm nice but i let them know i will check behind them i expect my customers to get nothing but quality product period and i guarantee my product 100 percent and you know, that that starts from the beginning all the way through the end. So for me, I'll open up a bag and I teach, you know, the people who work for me how to harvest properly. And so that's part of it. You know, I don't want to knock distributors. I certainly am not knocking distributors because that, that'd be kind of like pooping in my shoe for the future, too. That'd be a bad idea. But just saying, if you're working, you know, you have a huge corporation that's just cranking out, we'll just say oyster mushrooms, because mm-hmm. that's the most common, the gray oysters you're going to find, mm-hmm. you know, on a menu. They're just cranking them through. You know, you think they're handling them very gently and putting them in the box just so? No, they're tossing them, they're getting them going. And, you know, for me, I want my product to arrive in good shape. I'm all about, you know, making sure that there's not, I've had customers not complain about mine, but tell me, yeah, well, I was frustrated buying this. And it doesn't matter whether it was a local grower or or a distributor, because either way, I'm not into talking poorly about people. That's just unprofessional and just I don't do that. So, but regardless of where it came from, you know, they'd say, well, I was frustrated because there were a lot of aborts on our abort is when a mushroom is growing little tiny cutesy baby mushrooms that you want to grow big and strong. They're called pins. Um, they can abort for different reasons and we won't nerd out on that. But the bottom line is, is that if you have a bunch of little tiny pins on there, it's going to add to the weight of the product you're selling the customer that's useless to them. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in selling useless product. No seeds, no stress, no stems. Exactly. So, you know, for me, I'm like, I make sure my employees pull off that type of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's just quality. Yeah. Your mushrooms are very manicured. I would say like, (laughs) They're, they're, They've been manscaped. They really have, yeah. But they're 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 pretty to look at. I well, mean, thank and, you. and mushrooms in general are pretty phenomenal to they look are at. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I've noticed. I mean, you know, if you go to Trader Joe's and get a you know vacuum sealed box of button mushrooms, it's yeah. kind of the most common generic. Yeah. You know, a little dirty. I mean, you know, it's like it almost makes you feel like they're more organic because there's dirt all over. Yeah, them. yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way because then you get a a little plastic ba- box of. Fox Farms and Forage Mushrooms, and they're beautiful, and they're oh, vibrant. The co- there's like wild <laughs> colors, and and they're all they're all delicious. But you kind of define that there's a there is a, it is a cut above, so to speak. Um, that's my goal. I'm not going to say they're perfect, but that's my goal. Yeah, and and I mean they yeah. can be you know, and, and even like getting back to Clark. I mean he, even in, in his Instagram feed, they're always loaded with these insane mushrooms that yeah. he's finding all these cool colors yeah. and. And whatever, but yeah, mushrooms are kind of they're like a, a form of art. Uh, they're, they they're are. beautiful. They are. They're um, beautiful. I'm sure your wife would enjoy photographing them. Yeah, there's a great winery that has the um, what is it? Uh, fly agaric mushroom. It's a mm-hmm. poisonous mushroom, mm-hmm. but it's yeah. the one that looks like uh, if you watch the Smurfs, like it looks like the house that they live in. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of yeah. got the big like, red cap. Like the with idea the, little... the Tosa Amanita species of some sort, probably. Yeah, that's the one you don't yeah. want to eat. No, no, no. Uh, there, there are Amanitas that. Are delicious. There are amanitas that make you high as giraffe, you know. And then there are amanitas that will put you 10 feet under. You know, for all of my debaucherous behavior, I've never uh, had any of those mushrooms that make you high. Me either. And that's the funny thing. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> we are going to have a little sidetrack here. It's Nothing. all good. No. no judgment, man. No judgment, man. <laughs> but seriously, it's funny because... It- Oh, gosh. It's like, because I grow mushrooms, people automatically make assumptions. And no, again, in our political climate, I'm not saying this is a negative thing. But, guys, I do shave my armpits. <laughs> and I, I hate patchouli. Check our show notes. Yeah, really. I hate patchouli. And I've actually never, ever 
in my life. I do own tie dye though, but I've never ever in my life physically seen a psychedelic mushroom. Obviously, if I've never seen it, I've seen pictures. Nor ingested. I've never taken them, and so it's funny because. Yeah, of course. There's always the, oh, you grow mushrooms, make mushrooms. Yeah, like, yeah, I kind of want to believe that you yeah. are eating those all yeah, the time. Yeah, But yeah. I guess it's I'm high right now. No, I'm <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? It's because it's like when people make the joke, like, you grow magic mushrooms. I actually like, have a comeback now. I'm like, yeah, mine are magically delicious. Booyah. But, you know, <laughs> it's funny, though. The people who come up to ask me for those yeah. are not who you think. You would think, oh, the younger kids, maybe, you know, somebody our age. Yeah. I'm 44, I'm assuming, y'all. Since y'all did the Flavor Flavor thing y'all aren't too far off my age not too far because i'm 44 years young Mm -hmm. and it's funny because the people who come up to me are the little old ladies i'm talking like 65 to 75 ish range that want magic mushrooms and they get pissed off when i tell them yeah it's weird well yeah their heyday was the middle of the Mm -hmm. 60s so that makes sense Mm. yeah Yeah. and i had one lady that came up and and my husband was there and I, i totally Sometimes I'm just clueless and I don't pick up on things. And she says, do you have mushrooms that have, you know, a little bit more bang for your buck? Okay, I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, she, and I'm a nurse. Oh, so she wants chanterelles or morels. Well, yeah. I'm thinking yeah. she wants health benefits because that's a big thing that right. you will see, you know, right now in the media is the health benefits of mushrooms. And I just assume she's talking about that. So I start talking about it. She rolls her eyes. You can tell she's getting irritated. My husband's standing there just kind of grinning because he knows what's going down. And so then she asks me again, and I go on a different tangent. And then she goes, you know, mushrooms that have more bang for the buck. And then finally my husband took pity on me. And he leans in and he tells me, I was like, oh, ma'am, I I don't grow those. Instead of just leaving it be, she goes, could you grow them for me? I was like, I don't like gel time. She goes, can you give me your hookup? I was like, who is this woman? Yeah. I was <laughs> yeah. like, what is this? She was determined. It was pretty funny, though. My husband still teases me about that. Hi, this is Mike Coscarelli from Anxiety Now. And Andrea Allen from the Hot Mess Comedy Hour. We just launched the brand new OG Podcast Network and wanted to let you know that you can hear ours and other great shows by going to ogpodcastnetwork.com. Also, be sure to follow the network on social media to keep up to date with new shows, videos, and live events. That's at OG Podcasts on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Or you can subscribe to your favorite OG podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, so um, what's your what's your best product that you that you grow, the best mushroom that you make, or your best seller? Oh well, I mean, I mostly sell to restaurants. I mean, I, I sell out of two farmers markets, but mm-hmm. but what type? Most of them will buy gray oyster mushrooms, and that has more to do with two things: one, price point, mm-hmm. and two, familiarity. And versus because they know you. No, not because of me. I, I, I Familiarity with the oyster the mushroom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you if you were to go, let's let's pretend. Let's take me out of the picture. Let's pretend I don't exist at all. If you were to just take a sample, I'm trying, but that's really hard for my hard. brain to imagine. It's really hard. <laughs> Matt and I are just <laughs> Matt and I are just sitting here interviewing nobody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, y'all trying to come up with a show that people are gonna actually listen to with no one in this chair. Yeah. But. Like, let's let's just say in the Raleigh area, you know, there's a lot of phenomenal restaurants. Yeah. Um, just say you took a sampling of twenty of them. If you look twenty at the, of restaurants, twenty or tw- restaurants, and look at their menus. Yeah. If you look at mushrooms, the mushrooms that are going to pop up on there are going to be your Garica species, would be your white buttons or portobellas, and then shiitake, and then oyster mushroom. Those are just the most common mushrooms yeah. that you're going to see on menus, and because of that, if you back that out more. Um, Globally, if you will, if you were to talk to distributors like Fresh Point, Foster Cabinets, or any of them, if you were to ask them what are their top sellers, they're going to tell you oyster mushrooms and shiitake, Mm -hmm. and specific to oyster mushrooms, the gray oyster mushroom. It has the best shelf life, and it's very versatile. It takes any cooking technique you can throw at it. So it's that, and it's familiarity. So if I were to look at all my orders to the restaurants, definitely gray oyster pops right up at the top but then again i work with an amazing lineup of talented chefs that like to push the envelope and explore and do different things and so on that note of course i'm a small grower you know i'm not some large corporation 
you know, they're, they have access to all these different varieties I'm growing and I grow a lot of different things. And so, you know, what I've been trying to do is introduce chefs to varieties they haven't seen before worked with. And so it's really, it's a lot of fun. Such as? Uh, some people call them cinnamon caps. Some people call them chestnut. It's foliota adiposus, the scientific Latin name. Um, and that's been fun to watch chef, chefs work with those. And they just love them because not only do they have a great flavor, you know, if you're a chef, you know, you want your, your, uh, your dish to be multifaceted. You know, not mm-hmm. only do you want it to be delicious, you want it to have that visual appeal. So those mushrooms are one that can give an aesthetic. So now, you know, you put a gray oyster mushroom or shiitake in a dish, you taste it, it's delicious, but it looks like a little blob in there if you even notice it, really. Whereas this mushroom keeps its cap and stem shape. Mm-hmm. And so that's one that... You know, it's a lot of shows. visually beautiful, mm-hmm. but then also so with even flavor profiles. Obviously, when you just say mushroom, everybody kind of goes to that earthy umami yes. flavor. Yes. Uh, but then inside of that, getting even deeper, mm-hmm. what are some of the flavor uh, differences between, say, a, an oyster mushroom to like a morel? And what are we getting from one? And why would we yeah. get one over the yeah, other? Definitely. And what I'll do is because when you get in saying oyster versus morel, I mean, of course you can forage oysters, but what I can do is I'll, I'll speak, I'll answer this first off just specifically to the ones that I grow because mm-hmm. I, I can tell you definitively. Um, this is what we talk about mostly at farmer's markets. I probably run my pie hole more than I sell mushrooms at farmer's markets because it's about education, you know. And uh, But even within just say the oyster mushrooms, and yes, the king oyster is an oyster. It is a pluritus species, but... I'm going to take that one over here, and we're just going to talk about the gray, the brown, the white, the golden, and the salmon for a second. Every single one of those mushrooms has a completely different flavor profile. Hmm. And so the gray oyster mushroom is the one that I have yet to come up with the words to adequately describe it. I just tell people that that one is like a medium flavor range where you've got shiitake is stronger and more, you know, umami and that musky in a good way flavor. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, down here you might have the white oyster, which I joke around and tell people that's the beginner oyster mushroom because it's just a very mild flavor. And the reason why we talk about this so much is it gets into when people come up and I don't know what to do with these mushrooms. Well, then you have to teach them about how to incorporate them into their meals. And so a lot of people just come up to the market and say, well, I feel like cooking this, and I'll find out what ingredients they're going to use, and then I'll make a recommendation on the mushroom. Mm -hmm. So that brings us back to the flavor profile. So, like, the gray is just that all around, throw it in any dish. The brown has that umami, you know, that earthy flavor. It's not as strong as shiitake, but it's there. The golden has, it's golden is funny because when you, everybody wants to smell everything and I always cringe when people want to smell salmon oysters. It's kind of like the, no, Oof. you know, cause they stink. Oh really? Mm, I do not like, I almost didn't grow salmon oyster mushrooms cause I walked into the fruiting chamber. This was back in my basement back in the day when I grew way too much and didn't really know what I was doing and had a whole bunch of salmon oysters flush at once. It's like a cross between latex paint and a not so fresh smell that I'll just leave it at that. I just it sounds like a durian fruit. Remember, or something. I'm a nurse, Whoa. and so there are things I've smelled that I'm not going to talk about on yeah. the show. Oh, wow. But I'm just saying it wasn't a pleasant smell. So, you know, those don't smell good. But the goldens are funny because when you first harvest them, I think they smell heavenly. It's like a cross between watermelon rind and cinnamon. Mm, you give wow. them two days, they're still fresh, but something happens within them chemically. I don't know. And then they start to smell. I love this one chef said one time. He goes, and I was kind of like that moment where I was like, no. He goes, oh, that smells just like a fresh caught bass. I'm like, you just had a totally different reaction than I would have mm. to fresh caught bass. You know, yeah. like I'd been recoiling in horror. <laughs> but they get a slightly fishy smell. But they're still perfectly good. It's just different mushrooms have different And then once you life. cook them, the di- there's different flavors that are yes, going to come out. Yes, definitely. And they don't keep the color. Everybody wants the golds to stay gold and the pinks to stay pink, and they don't. Yeah. So what, what do you stay, stand on Cremini's? Aren't those just basically like a, a bastardized version of a button? Yeah, the agaricus species. And, and because I don't grow them, I'm not going to claim to be an expert. And I'm sure I'll probably say something wrong here. But my understanding of the agaricus species, like your your button mushroom, your portabella, your baby belly, your cremini are just different stages of maturation of the same mushroom right. or, or of a couple varieties of that mu- of the agaricus species. Is it like a plant or a vine? Like when you're starting to grow, you know, if I, if I take everything back to wine, like if I'm going to plant Syrah 
vine, mm-hmm. I'm going to get Syrah mm-hmm. grapes. So how does that work with mushrooms? Do you know, oh, okay, I'm planting the salmon oyster mushrooms or I'm planting mm-hmm. shiitake. You do know that. Yeah. It, and how, what does that come from? That comes, that's initially a, f- a fungus or? It's, I, I, it's mycelium, which is. Mycelium. My, it's mycelium. 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 Not her celium. Yeah. <laughs> mycelium. It's not her celium. Yo celium is mycelium. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's funny because take your psyllium elsewhere <laughs> exactly especially if it's nasty and stinky but it's funny when you said that because my mind started thinking about something that's going to be part of my answer even though you said you planted those vines the environment and that soil is definitely going to affect the flavor of those grapes sure yeah 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 of course so that brings me to a point I'm going to make so okay. there are different substrates that you can grow mushrooms on what is a substrate? Oh, gosh. See, I, I said, and you did a good job of stopping me yeah. when I say something. You're like, what? Substrate is just the medium. It's just what you're growing the mushrooms on. Yeah. So, like, you, you walk out in the woods, you're going to see mushrooms growing on trees. Or you might see them. You think they're growing in dirt, but they're most likely growing out of decayed wood, you know, or mm-hmm. root systems mm. under, under the soil. But when you're looking at growing them commercially, you know, some people will grow them on straw some people will grow them on sawdust if you look all around the world people are just growing them on what they have available like somebody might be growing them on sugarcane stalks you know well isn't the major thing about white truffles that they're grown on pig shit <laughs> or like that that's part of the thi- that's part if of like that, the magic i was gonna say i know nothing about that but if they grew on pig shit boy i'd really have a lot of troubles because i've got a few pigs yeah but my understanding because people ask yeah, me to a kill lot, people we, yeah no, or no, dispose, no, that's to dispose of the dis- bodies dispose of get them. it straight man yeah, seriously max yeah. come on Jeez, give it the program pun intended <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that that's a that's a total, or you you just don't know. Like that's what I'm I've not, heard that yeah, in not. Alba where white truffles happen. Yeah, see, no, okay. Whenever I think of pig and truffle, I think of the pigs that find the truffles. They're the foragers. Yeah. Mm. But then they stopped using the pigs because they were too smart, and they would just start eating the truffles because they're pigs. Mm. Uh, and then some people train dogs, but again, the dogs are, I heard are, are yeah. what they use now because they're a little bit more obedient and yeah. won't eat said truffle yeah. because those truffles could be like four hundred dollars an ounce yeah. or something yeah, yeah. That'd, that'd be a very expensive pitch, i i do love right and there. i've mentioned it before on the podcast but uh especially back when we were in los angeles and i think you might remember these guys but we had the like super uh shady looking guys from <laughs> from deep like from italy that came in super and they shady. they I came like packing uh oh, with the be. uh aforementioned firearms oh. uh to our back door what? but they were truffle salesmen and they were always walking they with they were packing heat yeah, Selling truffles. because oh well, gosh. it was in Los Angeles and it was a little tough oh, area. Oh, I thought you meant it was here. I was like, what? no, but they were packing heat. And a uh, former guest <laughs> of the show, Frank Fronda, he was our chef at Cafe Del Rey, and he's right. running a bunch of bunch, bunch of restaurants around. Uh, he would buy kind of like back door. Literally, these guys would knock on the door, show up with a briefcase, open it up, and they'd have crazy you know black wow. or or white winter yeah. white mush uh truffles and they'd weigh them and it was like it looked like a drug deal going down totally it kind of is that, yeah it. but it was like the same thing at blt <laughs> yeah but like one guy is at the door watching their backs and all that while the other guy's you know showing yeah. the product and then it's like all of it's just like hey max he, you know i was a bartender at the time and i had a till yeah. he'd like run over he's like uh just give me like 400 dollars out of the bank I'm like, what? He's like, these guys. I can't write these guys a check. Yeah, and so oh I'm just we'll giving make them the cash. Later. We do a little like you know paid out for it, and and they're on their way. And th- that's kind of the, I do know a guy that does it. He's totally respected, <laughs> and he has a legit business here in in the area. Yes. Uh, but he's he sells truffles, and they're yes. awesome. But he is like you know he's always watching his back too, and he's got like a, a, a locked. Uh, case and you know and he's just like <laughs> they're walking around with thousands of dollars of product literally it, yeah I mean it is a currency but I it mean makes sense I'd asked you via email if you knew like if if either a you or knew anybody in North Carolina made truffles yes and, and what was it there you was somebody here in North Carolina I don't know somebody when. does it but I love you wrote. I don't grow them because you have to plant a particular tree, inoculate yeah. it, wait 10 years, and pray it worked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was my understanding yeah. of it. And when I looked at that, I was like, I'm young, but I ain't got that kind of time. Yeah, that's like huge <laughs> risk-reward. And uh, like I told her on the email, I don't want to be that guy inoculating trees. <laughs> There's a lot of bad jokes uh, right there. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I don't even know the process because, again, I, I'm like a horse with blinders. I focus on what I need to do. So, mm-hmm. I, like I said, don't anybody who's out there going, what the hell is she talking about? She's wrong. Yeah, I might be wrong if it's not my area of expertise and I don't know much about it. But I could totally see why someone would have to operate in that manner because, yeah, those things are expensive. Yeah. But back to your business yes. and getting back to the idea of the substrate yeah. helping with flavor. Yeah. So you're saying that that's a huge component. It is because when I first started out growing mushrooms, you know, there was a progression of, of method and substrate. You know, of course, I always want to be a sustainable and friendly to the environment. So I started out growing in these five gallon food safe buckets and um, pasteurizing straw, whether that was heat pasteurization, you know, cold pasteurization. There was all these different, you know, things that I tried it out and when I got to the point where I wanted to do it commercially because I had chefs coming to me I was like oh if people come to me this might be a sign I might should do this hmm. so I had switched to sawdust in the form of hardwood fuel pellets at that time now I work with raw sawdust which can be a real tricky bitch sometimes but um <laughs> kind of like me baby <laughs> that, isn't that what they call you raw sawdust I- I no, think, tricky bitch. I was gonna say I think we have a title for for our episode. Yeah. Meet a tricky bitch. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it's interesting though, because aside from getting into, you know, the, the logistics of how limiting straw can be for growing because sawdust is gonna open up doors to growing all kinds of different species, there really is a flavor and I don't want to say quality because I don't want anyone to think I'm knocking on straw-grown mushrooms. I'm not doing that. But I will say texturally, there is a difference because mm. I've grown both. That's just mm-hmm. my personal observation. Someone else might say I'm full of shiitake. But, uh, but for you, the, the, you're saying that for, for you personally, the best tasting ones come out of growing on raw I mean, sawdust. let's get real. You go out in the woods. You see mushrooms growing on straw. No. no. You see them growing on... Wood. Wood. Yeah. On trees, so it's yeah, kind of so. like if you want to grow something, I think it's best to try to mimic nature. I'm always pissed off at Mother Nature because she's so much better than I am. Right. So when I saw in that video that I alluded to in the beginning of the show, you had these big like plastic um, five gallon drums. Mm-hmm. Like uh, it's the same thing that you know if you're a chef, it's like when you buy. When you buy pickles in bulk, it's like that, or a big paint jar, or was it blue and about blue. this tall and had holes? In had holes everywhere. Oh yeah, that was the beginning of, of it, this whole thing. So I was beginning. So, so were they? They were affixed to because I did see there were some mushrooms that were kind of growing on the mm-hmm. side of that. So was that your? connector at the time it was growing on plastic or, or, no, or you was, were able to that was just a vessel to hold yeah the, and, and there are people who do and especially if, when you ask about growing on a hobby level i mean a good way for a hobbyist to start is if you get into straw whether it's hot or cold pasteurization using a bucket whether or a vessel whether it's a five gallon bucket or it could be a rubbermaid bin all you're doing is you're putting the the straw that's been pasteurized because first fungus in wind so you're trying to kill off everything else and then you have your spawn whether it's sawdust spawn or like me i use grain spawn which is the mycelium and i'm pointing at you because you asked me this mm-hmm. earlier um you inoculate which is putting that grain or substrate whatever you yeah, use. yeah you do yeah that's right you get in you inoculate that <laughs> You see her like gangster rap. She's got like a headband on. I'm going to inoculate you. You know what? This is giving me. I'm always looking for new business ideas. (laughs) Uh, What do you you use to inoculate? Well, the the process is where I was saying, you know, inoculation is simply introducing Mm -hmm. that culture, that mycelium of whatever that culture is you're choosing. So let's say I want to grow some gray oyster mushrooms. Yeah. You know, Back in the day, I used to, because I'm, I'm a total freaking nerd and proud of it, but I used to love to go out and clone mushrooms, you know, take a little tiny little piece of them, and, you know, I would make agar and pour them in Petri dishes in front of my laminar flow hood. Laminar flow hood, because I know you're probably like, what the hell is that? It's simply, it is a filter, a HEPA, great filter, mm-hmm. has lamina, you know, like when you think... I don't know. I was looking for a vent like that. Those are lamina, essentially. It's like just, air conditioning mm, vent, yeah, or heater vent. Yeah. yeah. So it's just the the metal or plastic or whatever it's made out of, and it directs, you know, the air. So the air comes at you. So the the idea is you have this clean workspace. Mm-hmm. So if you have air coming out at so many CPMs or whatever, I don't get into all that logistical crap. I just want it to work. So you know, 
some contaminants coming down goes whee you know it doesn't get into your workspace and of course there's it's like the 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 fly fan at a grocery store when you walk in and it's always blowing yeah, air out yeah, it's just, pushing it out so that nothing can get exactly it's keeping a constant flow of exactly, air exactly so nothing stays yeah, stagnant exactly but yeah. it's it's not you know blowing hard it's blowing just hard enough to not disturb the workspace in front of you but to keep contaminant from coming in mm-hmm. and so you know when you're inoculating you know some people will do it in a crude manner where they don't do it in front of a laminar fluid and then you know others like me i definitely do it in front of a laminar fluid with the method that i use but in any case when you have that clean grain spawn or sawdust spawn where you have introduced a little bit of that culture and it grows on it because it's a food source you know mushrooms are incredible because they they have the biggest will to live of any creature i've ever seen they're just like i'm gonna eat anything i can they'll eat jeans there are some they'll eat plastic it's crazy Mm. but you introduce that colonized grain, I'm just going to say grain spawn for my purposes because what sure. I do, then if you were utilizing straw like we were talking about because we were talking about the bucket method that mm-hmm. I had used, you know, then you're mixing that all together. Back when I did that, no, I was not doing that in a laminar flow hood. You, <laughs> that'd be kind of hard. I mean, I'm sure maybe there are people that do, but I don't. And I sure as heck don't work with straw anymore. That stuff, the devil substrate. It gets in places you don't ever want to admit that it got there. Mm. So, <laughs> straw's awful. And you know it's itchy. So, <laughs> you mix it all together. <laughs> all the visuals. And then you just pack it down tight. And you're packing it down tight into the bucket because you don't want a lot of air spaces. Because, you know, that's going to be more work for the mycelium if you will to cover that substrate so then the holes the holes okay the holes on the side of the bucket mm -hmm. the holes on the side of the bucket think of it like this this is a general premise in growing mushrooms i don't care how you're growing them what you're growing them with the bottom line is they are like us what do they want oxygen Oxygen. Mm -hmm. so once that substrate is completely colonized the next stage for them is go Ooh, we're gonna pin because what do they want to do they want to complete their life cycle their whole life cycle is growing pinning maturing dropping spores and then hoping that that hits some other substrate and they're just going all over you know so you pop holes on the side of the bucket and they you can focus that that's where yes, they'll grow because yes, they're they're yes, reaching that spot yes. to get air and then there's the whole thing of you're doing that but then you know reasons behind you put them so far apart or whatever and you can actually make larger fruits smaller fruits you know because that when you're talking about the fruit of the mushroom that's a very confusing thing but yeah but people call the mushrooms the fruit mm-hmm. and sure. it's really weird because a lot of people think fruit they're thinking strawberries well it's what you're and reaping yeah exactly yeah. so if you wanted a really large cluster or larger clusters you put less holes <clears throat> if you want a bunch of smaller clusters you put more holes so there's kind of some science behind it because that block or bin or whatever of substrate is going to have so much energy and it's whether it's going to distribute it or focus it i got a question so from the moment you inoculate and set it how long until we have mushrooms depends on which um species you're working with so let's just call your gray oysters which seem to be a, a common occurrence at your place um those those are it's like this is where i'm torn because i will tell you guys i do get torn with um, I don't like to disclose exact information because of the fact that I have people that contact me on a daily basis trying to get me get me to give them information on how to grow mushrooms. So Can you give us a range? I'm, I'm gonna say I'm going to give you ranges. Cause sure. Is it like a week? Is it a month? Is it a um, year? It will take what I tell people in general mm-hmm. with mushrooms. Um, depending on the species, it can take anywhere from from the time that i call an uh, inoculate a block to the time that i harvest it it could be three weeks up to okay. five months yeah oh. yeah yeah so it's not i mean uh, you can look at a farm and you know future guest of the show david mcconnell he's an amazing farmer and mm-hmm. you know he's over there at standard and he's got his own farm coming mm-hmm. up soon infinity infinity hundred cool. um we would talk about just Day to day, things would change. I mean, the farm, nothing was growing. You know, he had just planted something, and then there'd be a wild rainstorm, and then the next morning, boom, everything's like budding. And the next day, he's almost picking things. It's just stuff was happening. I didn't realize how fast the the farming process would go as a layman in the farming industry. And so so I was just trying to get a rough estimate. So there still is a growth period. Obviously, like if we're comparing it to wine, that's a gestational period of – 
you know, eight, eight to 10 months or so from bud to, to exactly. fruit. And, uh, but so there's somewhere in between a little faster than that, but, but still yeah, takes some time to grow. Definitely. And that's a good point that you make because the chefs that I work with, um, recently I kind of changed my game plan because I'm trying to make sure, you know, cause this is a business, right. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to get more customers and, I hate wasting food. I just cannot stand it. So the concept of growing mushrooms and throwing them out, I don't throw them out. I give them to my pigs and, you know, they complain, but whatever. You know, and then just like my kids, you know, or I put them on the compost pile. I donate them, you know, whenever there's a good cause, you know, I donate. But the point is, is that I'm looking at the business to make money. So I have a lot of chefs that have standing orders. It's good for me because I can say, hey, I know what I need to grow. And it's good for the chefs because they know they can count on the mushrooms. Recently, I've started a new method that I'm doing both where I'm trying to grow a little bit more and have it available for chefs to order first come, first serve. Well, the problem with when you're working with chefs and I make sure they're educated about it is I'll give an example sometime last year someone had said to me oh well I was looking to because I always tell them I first start working with them and every once in a while I'll remind them because you know it's easy to forget if you're looking to change your mushrooms make sure you give me I always tell them give me at least two months notice if not more mm-hmm. because the, <laughs> the chef says oh I really want kings and I said great so when do you start and he goes next week and I was like well that's kind of a problem because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't turn it around in a week because king oysters for example from the time they're inoculated um, to the time I'm harvesting them can take anywhere from six to eight weeks okay yeah it just depends on the w- conditions what about on let's do this a two-part yes. Yes. uh my favorite mushroom is hen of the woods mushroom. Oh, yeah. And the reason I, I and I wasn't even into like mushrooms really, like I'd be okay. But then uh, when I worked at BLT, they were uh, in a side dish that was yes. always available. And so they would be uh, served in this really warm ramekin that would be in the oven. Lots mm-hmm. of salt and a little bit of butter, mm-hmm. but they were so freaking good oh, and really yeah. got me into it. So oh, yeah. uh, what, so two questions, how long or like how hard are those to grow? And then if I like those, uh, and that's my palate, what other mushrooms in that family should I try? Well, that's a several-part you know part question there. So one of the questions was, um, how hard are they to grow? Just like me, they a tricky bitch. Hmm. You know? <laughs> I'm not really a tricky bitch. It's just fun to say. It makes but, sense, though, that anything that's awesome and delicious oh, yeah, is not the, easy. Don't to, eat me! It's a labor of love, yeah. <laughs> like, Pinot Noir is an amazing wine, and it's yeah. also one of the hardest grapes to right. grow. Kind of makes sense. Right. I got, at first, I was like, oh, he's saying I'm awesome. But then when you saw it's delicious, I was like, whoa, boys, whoa, I'm not edible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Talking about my taki. Okay, gosh. Yeah, so, but, so Hen of the Woods, the other name for him is my My Taki, my taki yeah. yeah. And it's funny because I always called him Hen of the Woods, but then, you know, chefs more often call him My Taki. So I just, I, you know, say whatever. And for but, those that don't know, they're the ones that look crazy and they have like, uh, I don't well, know. They, I, I personally don't think they look like a hen, but the idea is they look gray or brown. And you imagine you pissed off a chicken who's, you know, got a little clutch of chicks and she fluffs up. And yeah. She bends over and shows you her booty, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. that would be the idea is it looks like a fluffed up chicken butt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds delicious. Anyways. <laughs> <want some> <laughs> But they're they're tricky. As a matter of fact, I'm working on they're they're my last. I'm not gonna say my last, but they're the current mushroom that I'm looking to perfect right now. Okay. Um, it's funny because you just think, oh, you just get a culture and you grow. It's not as simple as that. I was uh, researching them, you know, I don't know, sometime last year, and evidently there are hundreds of cultures out there. You know, many mm. different species, but only a certain number of them are. And I say commercially viable, and what I mean by that is you have to be able to grow it in quantity and size enough for your, you know, the labor that you and your costs you put in actually come out with a profit. Right. So, you know, I've been growing on a certain mix, which I'm not going to talk about that because I don't want to give my competitors any edge. Not that I feel like I have competitors. We're all just working out there yeah, together. Yeah, but it's you know? your secret sauce, whatever. Exactly, that's fine. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so... With that, I've been playing around with different substrate mixes and different strains. And I have chefs asking me frequently, hey, 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 you, you got those ready? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting close. But my taki, depending on the strain that you're working with, you know, 
on average, you'll read that they can take six months or more. But then, you know, there are things that I'm playing with and things that I've seen other people claim that they've done where they've turned them around a lot sooner. And there's this whole balance of what they like, what they don't like. And I'm playing with that right now. And uh, I love some maitake, so I hope I, you know, get closer to where I can release them to the chefs in quantity. Why is maitake, like shiitake maitake, all these, are they all of, like, originated in Asia or these? I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I mean, that sounds Japanese to me. Yeah, I yeah it is, it's a Japanese word. Yeah, but I don't know, honestly. Maybe it's just know. where the classification came from, mm. and perhaps. Maybe. But, yeah. I mean, just, yeah, just like, I mean, we have a lot of. Well, it's we like French culture. We French speak culture. in French terms, yeah. so maybe, yeah, you're right, that they yeah. just yeah. like did the uh, identify. And it's funny because there are some people who are commercial mushroom growers that just will look at me and be like, I can't believe you don't know that. But see, I focus my knowledge base and injury on things I need to get done. I'm like, I don't give a crap about that. Yeah, you're growing, yeah. not classifying. Yeah, but I don't mean that in a, sar- a sarcastic way, but it's just I'm sure there are some commercial mushroom growers out there if they were listening to this, be like, I can't believe she didn't know the answer to that. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, but to your point, who cares? It's, that's right. I'm like, I'm making good mushrooms. That's all. Exactly. Did it help my mushroom grow? No. Don't right. care. <laughs> um, I do have one other question yes. because you also have a, gr- a degree in zoology. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems that like there's mushrooms that grow wild in my backyard, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But my dogs who eat everything somehow either don't eat those or don't get sick from them. So yeah, do you think the dogs have an innate sense of what's poisonous and what's not? Some people would argue yes. Some people would argue no. Mm-hmm. My general rule of thumb is if you see it growing in your yard and your dog is known or have any animal that is known to eat it, just pull it out get rid of it because you don't know Mm -hmm. um you know i mean if if you were knowledgeable about it and be like oh that's just a such and such you know then it doesn't matter and also just like human beings animals can react differently to different mushrooms right you know and that whole thing where people say that oh goats eat everything and you know they're fine that's actually not true i go through my pasture frequently and look for any mushrooms popping up because yeah i have some of the amanita species that are poisonous that will pop up in my pasture and you better believe i'm out there pulling them up and throwing them out in the yeah. woods because i do not want my goats to eat one it'll kill them mm. well as we get close to the end of the show that was one thing that i um if your ankle's up for it and if you have a moment <laughs> there's uh there's a I've little- never heard that before ankle's <laughs> <laughs> that hamburger meat ankle is up for the task. Uh, when we close this show, uh, there's a little meadow and a little creek down behind uh, behind my house. Yeah, uh, I've never seen the name of the creek, so I just named it Trujillo Creek uh-huh. because oh, there you go. put my name on it, stamp it, kind of like an trademark. Explorer. Yeah, <laughs> I think you, should, my, you should put a flag. And what's funny is I said this to you know uh, my next door neighbor and house house voice of the show Brian Hoyle. He's like, well, you know that actually has a name. I'm like, I don't want to know the name. Yeah. It's Trujillo <laughs> Creek. That's it. <laughs> But when I take the the girls back there, we like there's it's a great little hiking trail. You can yeah. you can see things. I see fungus and mushrooms all over the place. Yeah, definitely. I would be curious to go down there with you yeah. and see if any of this stuff would be forageable mm. or if it's like oh get away from that don't don't yeah, whatever. Yeah. So maybe if if you're down, we'll walk over there and I'll, I'll do a little video of us going through <laughs> and you'll see it's not too far. It's like a hop skip and a and a and a longboard roll down the, the hill. <laughs> But we do, before we get out of here, Matt, do you have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, just where can we find your stuff? Um, or well, at the, what farmer's market or what chefs, how could they buy your mushrooms if they want to get in well, touch with you? So again, several answers to that question. The one, as far as the general public wants to purchase them, yeah. every weekend at Western Wake Farmer's Market in Morrisville, yeah. I have a big booth. props to Jim Pellegrini. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> yeah, Western yeah. Wakes Farmer Market. Yeah, they work. They work really hard to promote that market. And yeah, that's a actually it's pretty really cool market. It's really cool, and it's about to get much cooler because the town of Morrisville partnered with them, and there's so like right now we're really stuffed in the. Um, I guess it's the police parking lot and something else there. We're yeah. stuffed in there, but they're getting ready to open up this wonderful dedicated spot that's going to have the farmer's market. I think they're even going to have like a covered area, which that would be rocking for us farmers not have to bring those damn tents. They're so heavy and they blow right. around. You know, yeah. you got to have your weights on them. But that's in Morrisville. I have a, a market there. I usually have an employee there. Mm-hmm. Um, not but- your son. Definitely not, because he'd be like, it tastes like ass. That's just bad for sales. 
But then at South Durham Farmers Market over off of Highway 55 in Durham, I always clarified it's not the Durham Farmers Market off of Foster Street because I've had so many people go there and go, well, you weren't there. And I'm like, you're right, because I'm at the South, South Durham Cross. one. South yeah. Durham. Exactly. So usually at the South Durham one, it's either my husband or I, and then we have an employee at the um, Western Wake one. And I'm just going to make a little plug. I grew way too much. I have a shit ton of shiitake. I grew way too much. And I have some beautiful kings. So this weekend, I've got those babies on sale. So nice please come buy them <laughs> and then in raleigh you can go to standard foods i think right yes. well i don't know are you still selling them yeah, oh yeah definitely yeah. um so one thing that's changed is again i can't stand those plastic clamshells and from storage perspective there they were not my first choice for storing mushrooms mm-hmm. but the packaging i wanted is was just cost prohibitive for the number of package sales that i do so it was really cool because recently it was just like hey um, I'm just not going to put them in those packages anymore. And they're like, cool, we'll just sell them loose. And so it was a win-win because they don't like packaging. I don't like packaging. It's better yeah. for the environment to not have that. And the best storage vessel for a mushroom really is a brown paper bag. So they'll buy the mushrooms that they want loose and then, you know, put them like they sell Wham. king, shiitake, and um, my mix of oysters, the different colors there. So you can get them there. And then I do have customers that do reach out to me and talk about looking like you're doing a drug deal. <laughs> People think I'm probably selling something off my front porch. Yeah, I am, boy. It's mushrooms, not drugs. But, you know, I call it the porch pickup. So sometimes people like, dude, I can't wait for the weekend. I got to have mushrooms. That really does sound drug related, doesn't it? It kind of does. Know, but I say, hey, I give me your an order. I put it. I, I give the address to pick it up. They can come get it as they want because I leave it in the cooler. And then mostly it's restaurants. You know, I'm very, yeah. very, very honest honored to be in the restaurants that i'm in not me personally but mushrooms yeah well i know a lot of the chefs that you work with and they're excited to work with you too because you bring a new level of mushroom to the uh, culinary level and it's great so yeah if you're dining in the triangle you're probably having some of amy's fox farms and forage mushrooms yes and just just like mushroom mycelium i'm spreading you know the fungus among us because i've actually just started a route in durham and chapel hill and so i was really excited like last night I had a chef call me when I was on my way home, and he wants to start a standing order. So, yeah, I'm starting in Durham. So. It's a good Incubus album, too. Yeah, Fungus yeah among exactly. Us. Yep. Well, thank you so much for giving back to our restaurant community. So we have a little something to give back to you uh, yeah. to make your life in the uh, while wow, foraging, not foraging, Y'all but farming sweet. mushrooms easier. Oh Guests of the oh, yeah. NCF&B receive gift bags sponsored by awesome products from local Local here. businesses in North Carolina. What you have in your hand right there is Social House, Kinston's very own Social House vodka, gluten free. It's North very Carolina. Good. Oh I've yeah, it's delicious. Bottles. Oh yeah. I probably shouldn't admit that, but yeah. <laughs> it's very good vodka. In- I saw her. She had a couple bottles before we hit record. Right before we started. Inebriation then inoculation. Woo, yeah, woo. you're. They, they uh, kind of go hand in hand. Exactly. Well, you know uh, Miss Annabelle Commissar with her Michael's English muffins. Oh, uh, she's a sweetheart. So those were fresh baked this morning. Ooh. And that is the Ramona wine cooler that will be awesome in the warm months wow. or any months. And that's, that's provided cool by packaging. Kellogg Selections. Yeah. Thank you. I've never seen that. That's and awesome. uh, you've got a, a, a water bottle from the NCF&B. That's um, awesome because I need to drink more water. I am the human camel. And, uh, you know, we actually have an, a new person that just joined up with them. Uh, Happy Hour Vitamins coming out of of Wilmington, uh-huh. uh, Ben Shaw creates these happy hour, uh, happy hour vitamins, multivitamin formulated for help uh, help with hangovers. So you can take before, while, or drink <laughs> while you're drinking. Uh, if you're already hungover, we'll take a dose and get you back on track. Matt and I went out last night. We uh, ate at Nana's, which was delicious. Yes. Chef Scott Howell made us uh, an amazing uh, meal, and I forced everyone to take these pills right before. And Matt, I feel great today. Yeah. Feel oh, awesome, Sweet. and and you had a good amount of um, wine. I enjoyed my uh, my drink last night. There's no shame in that. <laughs> um, and Good then luck. also to pick you up. Yeah. After that is Larry's Beans, which nice. has provided uh, some personal coffee that are flavor profile significant to each guest. So yeah. so that particular one you have is a a, a scientific designed uh, um, what do you call it a sci- a, a a personal roasted blend from 42 and Lawrence that's right down there in uh, downtown Raleigh. Oh, I know 
at them. You know I got guys. caffeinated by them last week with my daughter. We went in there and got these scrumptious mint mochas. Oh my god, they were so good. So I got my uppers, I got my downers, yeah. I got balance. and you got your coolers. And you got your vitamins. Heck you got yeah. your carbonation. Yeah, you're you got a and, whole weekend. And, and ahead I, of you. I was gonna say, and and I've had her her muffins before, and man, they're hot diggity damn good. So so I'm not eating on an empty, drinking on an empty stomach. So Correct. I ate my muffins. Get a, little, get a little peanut butter and some uh, yeah, bananas, in there. and you can do your own scoozy uh, as her, her, exactly. her dad That's created. Right. And, I, and I need to hook up with that that product. Although it's, it's in there too. That's in, it's in the bag. The, uh, the the vitamins are in the bag. You just haven't found them. But uh, cool. Yeah, it's a total game plan now. Yeah, so I have to do it privately so I don't scar anyone for life. <laughs> Let us know about it. <laughs> Well, Amy, thank you again for coming on in here. Go to foxfarmandforage.com uh, if you have any questions. Yeah. If you're a chef and you're looking to expand your, your fungus uh, on fungus your menu. Fungus. Actually, even better, chefs, can, can I say? Um, Instagram. Yeah. Instagram. Look, search Fox farm forage i am mostly active on instagram my website is more just like a landing place and sure. then i do have my link to my facebook business page and my instagram which hopefully their eyes will go oh, and click on it but i have the instagram page for two reasons i mean well the biggest reasons obviously promote my business but it allows custom potential hopefully potential customers and by the way i'd love 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 to talk with scott how you hear me scott but uh <laughs> but uh on instagram a chef can go there and see examples of my product yeah and, know and then direct expect message you exactly. straight from there i tell people um to either direct message me or send an email to amy at foxforage.com and then my facebook page but all that has links on how to get up with yeah very cool, cool. Well, well, thank you very much for being on the show, Matt. What I else you got? Fun. Yeah, thank you, Amy. You are, you are one tricky bitch, and I mean that That's in the right. best way. Boy. Everybody <laughs> out there, go grab some uh, Amy Fox mushrooms, yeah. cook them up, and eat and drink merrily. That's right. <laughs> Guests of the NCF and B podcast receive a swag bag, including guests from these rock star North Carolina producers. Larry's Beans and 42 and Lawrence, Social House Vodka, Ramona Wine Coolers, and Michael's English Muffins. And we just added Happy Hour Vitamins. Thanks for listening to the NCF&B Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged.